Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to be doing this again because it means you guys like my talk and that's what it's all about. And uh, it's a pretty discerning crowd, so I feel very happy about that. Okay, um, I'm going to be talking about Codec 2, uh, open source speech codec that's designed for very low bitrate speech compression in the range of 2400 down to 1400 bits per second and below in the future. Uh, the main applications are more uh, digital radio, uh, so making um, uh, wireless radio phone calls over HF and VHF radio, uh, a little more so than VoIP, and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, it's a work in progress. Um, you can download samples and source from my website. And the idea is to uh, fill a gap in open source speech codecs beneath 5,000 bits per second. There's been some really good work done in um, audio and speech coding above 5,000 bits per second, speech, vorbis, and now opus. Um, but this is one area where you still don't have an alternative for a good quality low bit rate speech codec, and we're trying to fix that. This will not be a DSP talk. I will not be talking about any of these topics. Um, I get to play with them all day and I'm bored. I want to talk about some more interesting open source stuff and, and use that to, uh, I guess, tangentially approach uh, the speech codec and hopefully give you all two or three takeaways about DSP, speech coding, and a few other topics. If you are interested in the DSP side, please feel free to contact me anytime and I'm happy to go through with any of these topics with you. Um, here are some of the topics I'd like to talk about. Um, patents and codecs, um, why this is so important from an open source point of view. Uh, codecs applied to voice over IP and digital radio. Um, proto geeks and ham radio, um, this idea that what we're doing is similar to some people were doing around 100 years ago and more. Same sort of people, but playing with uh, ham radio rather than today's computers. Uh, I'll have some demos of the speech codec and I'd like to relate that to the room acoustics and how it changes the speech. Um, talk a little bit about why voice is not like data. When you send a voice packet over a data channel, why you should treat it differently. What my speech codec has in common with weapons of mass destruction. And we'll also have a, a non-DSP description of how Codec 2 works using a, a few graphs and plots. What can you do with a speech codec at 1400 bits per second? A standard phone call goes through a 64 kilobits per second channel. That's your standard landline call that might go over fiber or ISDN. Uh, we can send 45 of those phone calls over one of those 64 kilobits per second channels. Uh, we can record a voicemail, a 30 second voicemail, which is five kilobytes. Or if you're into audio books or podcasts, we can squeeze uh, 30 minutes of that into just 300 kilobytes. So it's a really tight compression ratio. Um, because it's optimized for speech, it won't do music at those sort of rates. You can't uh, go and recode your MP3, li MP3 library. It'll only work for voice. Uh, Codec 2 is not that useful for VoIP. Um, the issue is that when you send a VoIP packet over the internet, there's a bunch of overheads, RTP, IP, uh, UDP uh, packets that you have to encapsulate the payload data in. The payload data is so small, seven bytes every 40 milliseconds, that it's just dwarfed by the payload data, which is around 8,000 bits per second. So we're using around, if you use Codec 2 for VoIP, I mean it'll work, but using 85% of the bandwidth just for the payload. As, sorry, just for the overhead uh, and only 15% for the payload data. Now, you can get around that a little bit um, by sending more than one packet, but unfortunately with voice, there's diminishing returns there. If you pack it up 40, or 100, uh, 40 80, 120 milliseconds of speech, you start to run into latency problems. People don't like the real-time data like speech being delayed too long. So that's not real useful to get around this problem. Um, what you can do is if you're trunking, if you have say 45 voice calls, you need to send between two IPs where all the data is going in exactly the same direction, then you can bundle up all those calls in one packet, only put all those overheads on once and then get some efficiency. So in general, not real useful for VoIP, but possibly if you're using it for trunking. The main application is voice over digital radio. Um, the big problem is that RF spectrum is extremely limited. There was only so much created in the universe. There's more and more people clamoring to use this uh, very scarce RF uh, resource. Now, one of the problems is simply not enough spectrum. There's only so many megahertz to go around. The other problem is uh, over a digital radio channel, you get noise, plenty of noise. And what happens when you send a bit in one end, you may not get the same bit in out the other end. It can be corrupted and uh, that can cause problems with your digital speech. Uh, service. Now, for the last 50 or 60 years or more, people have been sending uh, voice over radio channels using analog techniques such as frequency modulation, FM or single sideband, SSB. They actually work really well. Um, those incumbent analog techniques have resisted change just because they do work so well. To make voice work as well, you need a really good voice codec uh, as well as some clever uh, modulation techniques. 
So uh, they've been kind of hard to dislodge, but people are now moving to uh, digital techniques because there's a lot of advantages and the technology is becoming mature enough to displace these analog techniques. Um, the problem is we need the right codec. Uh, currently we tend to use proprietary lockdown codecs and there haven't been too many choices. So it's uh, resisted the choice for digital speech to proprietary codecs, which is pretty un unpleasant. Um, now, compressed speech means you require less bits per second over a channel. There's two uh, factors that are associated with this. One is simply reduced spectrum that you need to use, that's good, but also reduced power, uh, which means if you're sending less bits over a certain channel, you can have a smaller battery, smaller radio, smaller transmitter. I'd like to explain a little bit more why a lower bit rate uh, is more helpful in terms of getting your signal over the radio channel. Now on the left here, we have a little, a little image of a, or graph of a signal uh, in, in noise. Now, for example, in this hall, my signal's quite strong. You can all hear me quite well, and the noise is very low. A little bit of typing on keyboards, a bit of fan noise, um, but that's all. So my signal's punching through. So this one watt signal in the middle here is like my signal, and that background noise is like this noise floor here. Over a radio channel, you have a similar problem. You're trying to punch through the noise, and there's some background noise you need to get through to get those bits received and then decoded as digital speech. So on the left, we have an example with a 1400 bits per second codec. We've got one watt available in our transmitter, uh, and we're getting above the noise floor quite well and being received okay at the other end. Now say we had a voice codec that wasn't quite as good, it couldn't compress as well. It's running at twice the bit rate, 2800 bits per second. We've only got one watt still, but we've got twice as many bits to send. So I've illustrated that in this picture by splitting the signal into two, uh, each of them carrying 1400 bits per second at 0.5 watt, still one watt total. Problem is now we're down near the noise floor. Some of those bits aren't gonna get received too well, we're gonna get bit errors, and the speech is gonna sound a little bit corrupted if it gets through at all. So we can actually get better power efficiency with tighter compression, better chance of getting our message through. Here's a picture of a, a typical digital voice radio system in which Codec 2 might operate. Uh, on the left-hand side here, we have um, uh, just the microphone picking up the signal converting the uh, you know, acoustic energy into electrical energy. That'll then go into an analog to digital converter, which does a kind of compression itself. It'll convert it to a stream of samples, for example, at 8,000 samples per second, 16-bit integers, uh, and then they'll get sent to the codec for compression. Out of the codec, we might get uh, 1,400 bits per second signals. That'll go into something called a forward error correction encoder, FEC. Now what that does is we've got our 1400 bits per second, that adds a few more bits, maybe brings it up to 1800 or 2000 bits per second. Those extra bits are redundant. Um, they're used to protect the information in the payload data. They don't actually carry any information themselves, uh, but we use those to cor help correct uh, bit errors in the entire system. We then send the entire signal with the forward error correction added into something called a modulator. The idea of the modulator is it takes the baseband binary data, the noughts and ones, and it converts it into an analog waveform that goes through a radio channel quite nicely. We then send it over HF or VHF radio into a demodulator, which takes those analog waveforms suitable for a radio channel and converts them into ones and noughts, uh, suitable for uh, processing in a digital sense. Now we apply our forward error correction or FEC decoder where we use that redundant information to hopefully correct some of the bit errors that we've encountered in the channel. Uh, we then have our 1400 bits per second signal go into the codec 2 decoder and that spits out 8 kilohertz 16 bit integer samples ready to play through your digital to analog converter and the speaker. It's important to realise that voice is not like data. Now normally when I fetch a packet off the internet from a website, that packet has to come back perfectly or somewhere in the protocol stack the CRC check says oh you've got one bit error, we've got to throw that away and ask for it again. Don't do that with voice, okay? Uh, if voice packets, if you've got a couple of bit errors in the packet, even if you lose the packet, you can generally do something pretty sensible with it at the receiver to play that packet out again and get some sort of sense out of it. The reason is that um, we have the human ear at the other end that's listening to the data. And if we hear a, hear a few clicks and pops, if it's not too bad, we can generally understand what's being said. Uh, the other reason is that um, speech is fairly highly correlated. What I've said here is pretty similar to what I've said here and here. So if we lose the middle packet, we receive packets one and three but lose number two, you can generally have a pretty good guess about what's in between. It doesn't have to be exactly the same as what was transmitted for us to understand uh, what was said. So uh, don't treat voice like data. Um, don't try and get it perfectly received or expect you need to. And if you take that into account, you can actually design really efficient voice systems that work really well, um, rather than being uh, less efficient in terms of power and bandwidth allocation. 
Okay, look at this guy. Can everyone see that okay? It's a guy on skis with a great big antenna on his back. And I'm not sure if you can see, but strapped to his chest, there's a, a box like this that's full of valves and knobs. And it's an early radio receiver. This is a picture I found in um, amateur radio history section of Wikipedia from 1924. This guy's an early uh, radio experimenter, or radio amateur, or ham radio guy. And he's um, doing wireless mobile uh, of the day. Um, he's probably lugging around 15 kilos on skis, and they're probably not even very good ski technology compared to what we have today. Uh, but he's playing around, and that was the technology of the day. This is back before people really know the best, knew the best way to build radios and radio receivers. So he's experimenting with one different uh, you know, mobile mode of wireless communication. And I'd put it to you that this is what we'd be doing if it was 100 years ago. It's the same sort of spirit of experimentation and uh, trying new things and you know, weird and wonderful things um, that these guys were doing early in the 20th century. These guys, to me, are the proto-geeks. They're from you know, where we evolved. Um, they're people experimenting with radio in the earliest 20th, 20th century. Now, some of the, the really early stuff um, around the turn of the century, the 20th century, that is, used mechanical means to generate radio energy. They had big alternators throwing out sparks, spark gap transmitters. The receiver was a test tube full of iron filings, and if the signal was received, the energy in the radio would make the, the iron filings stick together for a moment. So they used mechanical means to transmit and receive radio signals. Uh, around about World War I, they invented the, uh, the valve or the vacuum tube, and now they can amplify signals. Electronics was born. 30 years later, those same valves were used to build the first computers during World War II. And you know, from there, the computers led to what we're doing today. If you're a geek in the 20th century, you were probably playing with ham radio uh, rather than computers until they came along. And what you were doing, well, you were building technologies, you were communicating with other people, doing the same thing, um, you were experimenting, you were sharing, you were learning. They were into, even into open hardware. Uh, they'd, someone would design a radio, they'd publish it in a ham radio magazine. Some other guy would say, I can improve this, they'd publish the improvement. And over 10, 15 years, you can see these designs of radios improving through open hardware hacking, basically. So what they're doing is a lot in common with the sort of thing that we do. Um, now, ham radio is a, an open and experimental service. Um, one thing that's key to it um, for a lot of people is the ability to experiment, to hack, to pull things apart, understand how it works and improve it. It's currently evolving um, like a lot of the other digital radio uh, or radio services from analog to digital. The hams are doing a lot of great work with uh, keyboard type modes using advanced modulation techniques, uh, very low bit rates that can go thousands of kilometres on a, you know, a few watts of power. Uh, but not much is happening in digital voice at this point. Uh, and one of the reasons is they, they're stuck with proprietary codecs. They don't have anything that can, um, is, is open source that they can use. And that's what I would like to help fix. Okay, so who am I? Um, I've been a ham radio operator for around 30 years, off and on. Um, I got my first ham radio license in 1981, and then my first computer a year later. And um, I feel really privileged to have lived through an age where both hobbies were taking off at the same time. You know? This was the first time someone like me for $400 could afford a computer and have one at home. And at the same time, I had the ham radio. So I, I really got my start in ham radio, probably moved more, more to the computer side, like a, a lot of us did. But um, you know, I still have the hobby dear to my heart and see a lot of parallels with what I'm doing today uh, back in ham radio. Um, a little after that point, I um, started working on speech coding and speech compression. I was involved in building some of the first real-time speech codecs in the late 80s. Um, until that point, the speech coding algorithms were considered so complex, they simply couldn't run on the processes of the day. It would take 30 minutes or an hour of workstation time, high-end workstation, to process three seconds of speech. Um, but towards the end of the 1980s, we got these fancy digital signal processors, the hardware uh, CPUs that were optimised, for doing digital signal processing operations. And with a lot of work, a lot of assembler, many months of work, we could get these things to run in real time for the first time. So I got my interest in doing uh, real-time speech coding first of all, uh, and then later on developed sort of the theoretical background uh, about how these things actually work. And these days I work on open software and open hardware for developing world communication. And there's um, my website there for those of you who might be interested in the other things I've been up to. Okay, proprietary codecs. Um, they come in hardware or licensed software form. Typically you buy a little DSP chip that's been flashed with someone's proprietary firmware. It's locked down that way. That makes it a bit difficult to distribute. You've got to get a physical item. You can't just download it and start hacking on it. Um, they can't be modified. Um, you won't find much information about them. 
uh, the people who distribute these codecs aren't interested in telling you how they work. And if you buy one, you are legally obliged not to modify it, or you have violated the license and you can get in big trouble. So it's really in completely the wrong direction for the sort of thing that guys like you and me want to play with, and uh, for the ham radio community. Another problem is codec royalties. Um, about 10 years ago, I had a, com a company that sold computer telephony hardware. So these were PCI cards, and at one end you had four or five uh, uh, telephone connectors. You plug one into the telephone lines, the other end went into the PCI slot. And we had a lot of customers who wanted to use these for things like early VoIP applications, and they wanted G729. I was quoted $40,000 for a license. It was simply too expensive for me as a small business operator. So that really put me off, even though I can write codecs, um, it really put me off as a codec user from a business point of view uh, that you had to pay these crazy license fees, um, you know, especially when you can get a first class operating system that's far, far more code than what's in the codec. Far more advanced algorithms, but I'm being told that I've got to be paid for this tiny little bit of code on it. So I, I figure just codec royalties are a useless tax on business and communication. Um, I, I know there's arguments that the royalties go back into improving it and making the world a better place, but I haven't seen that happen. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to listen to counter examples, but um, I, I don't believe the license fees benefit anyone except the people receiving the license fees. Um, a closed so source codex stifles innovation in education. An open source one promotes innovation in education. A closed source codex makes a small number of people very rich, and an open one helps a large number of people. So I've decided where I want to play. Um, I've got this image of um, patents as toll, toll booths, but normally a toll booth's on a freeway that some companies paid a couple of billion dollars to make, but I see codec patents as toll booths on public roads. And I'd like to explain that a little further. Um, the dirty little secret is that the authors of proprietary codecs borrowed heavily from the public domain. Around 95% of the code in one of these licensed codecs that they want us to pay for came from you and I in the public domain. Um, what they did was they worked out about 5%. They made it really unique. They made it work really well. Good engineering, no doubt about that. And then they locked that 5% up with patents so that you can't really use the rest and get a bitstream equivalent codec without using uh, their patents and paying them their royalties. So to me, it's like we've got this public road system. Someone's built a little section of road and just put a nice big toll booth on it. And now they're charging us for access to the technology that we really own. Um, but the good news is, because they've only patented 5%, there's nothing really to be scared about. There's no mystery about the codex uh, or anything to worry about. Once you get into it and have a look at it, you just have to replace that 5% with something that's an alternative to get the same sort of uh, quality codec uh, developed for, in an open source form. My understanding is that you could not patent math, but you can patent algorithms. Where's the line exactly? Uh, I'm not really sure, because I've never applied for a patent. Uh, uh, the question, and I, I'll just mention, I don't want to take any more questions to the end of the talk, but the question was, um, you, with a patent, can you, only patent uh, can you only patent the maths and not the algorithms? Uh, I'm not really sure, because I've never applied for a patent. Um, now, I'd like to talk about speech coding uh, and what that's all about. Um, the basic idea is we take uncompressed speech, for example, 16-bit samples at 8 kilohertz sampling rate, and then compress it way down. Um, Speech coding is the art of what can we throw away. So we've got this original speech signal. Fortunately, speech is very structured, and I'll show you some graphs in a minute. There's a lot of uh, what we call correlation or similarity between adjacent bits of speech. So the idea is what we'd like to do is uh, throw away as much as we possibly can, but retain intelligible speech. Intelligible means you can understand what I'm saying, the message gets through, and you can understand it when various speakers with various different accents and languages talk, the message gets through the other end. Retaining natural speech means that, uh, in particular at low bit rates, it doesn't sound like a robot. It sounds like uh, the natural person who first talked into the uh, uh, speech codec. So you should be able to recognise, for example, the speaker, male, female, man, child, your friend, someone you don't know. So two goals there, retaining intelligible speech and retaining natural speech. Um, there's a couple of ways of doing this, but for very low bit rate speech coding, we use something called model-based speech coding. So instead of taking the, the speech waveform, and sending some version of each sample of that waveform. We actually look at a big chunk of that waveform, say 20 or 40 milliseconds, and we fit that to a model of human speech production. And once we've fitted it to that model, we send parameters that describe that model. We might update those every 20 or 40 milliseconds. So model-based speech uh, compression is how we handle these fairly low bit rates. So an example of a model parameter is the pitch of the human voice. Um, now that ranges between about 50 and 500 hertz. A, a deep maritone, a baritone male speaker will talk in the range of 50 hertz. 
um, and a young child would have a pitch of around 500 hertz. Um, and the pitch actually is time varying. As I'm talking, my pitch is going like this as I articulate words and syllables, um, but it's varying within a certain range uh, for me. Um, you can actually represent the pitch of a human voice with about seven bits of information. So you can take that 50 to 500 hertz range and chop it up into little intervals. And uh, that might be, you know, like 50, 55, 60, 65 hertz. Uh, and then you can transmit that. If you transmit that every 20 milliseconds, you generally can't hear the difference from not um, quantizing the pitch at all or for using more than seven bits. So with around seven bits, we can represent human pitch ac accurately, and that works out to around about 350 bits per second if you update it every 20 milliseconds, just to re represent the pitch. Then, there's, then uh, depending on your speech model that you use for your codec, there's a bunch of other model parameters as well. But I just wanted to give that as one example of a model parameter for human speech. Okay, Codec 2 uses sinusoidal speech coding, and I'd like to uh, talk about that in a graphical sense over the next few slides. Um, this is a, a graph of a speech waveform in time. So uh, this is actually a short segment of around 40 milliseconds of a female speaking a vowel. Um, the amplitude, how high the signal is going, how loud she's talking at that particular time. And you can see um, that that's, that signal's getting louder over the frame, so the amplitude's getting higher. It's probably the start of a vowel. Uh, rather than a steady state part of it. Now, one thing uh, that's interesting with the speech signal is, if I've got my mouse back there, what you can see is the signal kind of repeating itself. So here's the start of one section. And if you look at this section just after it, it looks very similar, except maybe scaled a little bit in amplitude. It's a little bit higher. Likewise, it gets repeated again. A signal that repeats itself regularly is called a periodic signal. Um, and in this case, for human speech, that's how we define the pitch. So the fact that this person repeats themselves, in this case, every 35 samples, um, or 4.4 milliseconds, that works out to around a pitch of 230 hertz. So as I said, this is a female, so she's in that sort of high range of the available pitch frequencies. So 230 hertz means 230 times a second this particular waveform gets repeated. Now from this you can get a bit of a clue about how we might compress the speech. It's not really necessary to send this whole waveform, just a bit, enough information to reproduce one of these periods. Then we can just play that back several times at the decoder and reconstru reconstruct the whole frame. Now if we look at the same signal, this is the same signal plotted in frequency. So along the bottom, we've got the frequency in hertz. For example, 500 hertz, 1000 hertz, etc., up to four kilohertz. And you can see it's got this spiky structure or comb-like structure. And it turns out that each of these spikes is a multiple of the pitch. So this first one's at 230 hertz, the second one's at 460, etc. And they're all equally spaced at this pitch period around 230 hertz. So they're called harmonics of the original uh, pitch. And they're all harmonics of 230 hertz. They vary in the height of each one. Um, but the frequency, if you know the frequency of the first one, you can work out the frequency of the rest of them. And that's another clue to how speech codecs work. Instead of having to send the frequency of each one of these lines, or harmonics, you can only set, if you send the frequency of the first one, you can work out what the rest are. So it turns out that any signal that is periodic in time, as this one's repeating itself, also tends to repeat itself in frequency, so you get these same spikes every time. Sort of a time frequency uh, duality there. Okay, now a sine wave is a signal that only has one frequency. So for example, this first spike is a sine wave at 230 hertz. That's what it would look like. It would just be a single, single spike by itself if we were just playing that one sine wave. This signal here is a sine wave at 460 hertz. So the sinusoidal speech coding model simply says, let's make speech using a bunch of sine waves uh, added together at different frequencies. Just like this. So we have... The first sine wave oscillator there, and then another one. Each of these has an independent uh, amplitude and frequency and, and phase. Uh, and then we just have a bunch of these to cover the entire spectrum. We add them together and we get something like a speech signal at the end of it. So here's a graphical example of how we can demonstrate how we can build up a, a signal from sine waves. Uh, the top plot is an original uh, segment of male speech. Um, this guy's a male, so his pitch is a bit lower, which means it takes longer to repeat itself. In this case, the first, if you look at starting here at, say, sample 100, it, tends to, it goes to about sample 200, then starts again, and starts again at sample 300. 
So he's got a 100 sample pitch period, which means a frequency of around 80 hertz, much lower because he's a, a deep bass speaker. Now let's try and reconstruct this signal using sine waves. Here's the first sine wave at 80 hertz. Let's add three. Now we're starting to see a little bit of repetition happening. Um, it's not exactly time aligned with the top, there's a little bit of delay, but that wouldn't matter if we replayed it. But you can see the pitch structure starting to evolve. 10 samples, 25, now we're really getting somewhere. It's starting to look very similar to the original signal. And with 50 we get something that's almost identical and would sound identical if you listen to it. So that's a simple graphical example of how we can reconstruct speech or model speech using a bunch of sine waves. Okay, this is the bit allocation of uh, the current Codec 2 alpha version. Every 40 milliseconds, we send uh, 56 bits. Um, most of them are used for the amplitudes, that's the height of each sine wave. So uh, we're sending information that describes the height of each one of these sine waves uh, as it goes up and down over the spectrum here. Uh, then we send some information about the frame energy, how high the actual frame energy is, the volume control, if you like. Uh, some information on voicing. Voicing is whether the signal is a vowel or a consonant. Um, and that, that changes the way we synthesise the speech a little bit. And then some information on the pitch. Is, is the current pitch 80 hertz, 230 hertz, 500 hertz, etc. And that's our bit allocation. Okay, I've got some samples to play to you now. Um, first of all, I've just got a, the standard male speaker. Um, I'm going to play um, 1400, 2400 and a, a, an example uh, codec, another codec that uh, is sometimes used for comparison. I've also got some samples of um, uh, background noise, uh, like speech signals corrupted by background noise. As I said, to get the high compression ratio, sometimes these codecs aren't very good on non-speech signals. Um, one very important non-speech signal is those with background noise. For instance, you're driving along with your car with the window down and you're getting some road noise or uh, air noise. What happens to the speech codec? Does it break down completely or can it handle that? Does the background noise sound like background noise or does it sound like something completely weird that you've never heard before? And that's particularly important for emergency services. You've got a siren going in the background. You don't want it to corrupt the message you're trying to send and you probably want to know there's still a siren in the background because that adds some importance to the message coming through. Um, these signals will sound better than they would through a headphones when I'm played over the room acoustics here. And that's because the room itself tends to um, distort the signal a little bit in a way that's favourable to my speech codec. It makes it sound a little better than it really is. Um, if you really want to hear it, um, hop on the website, grab the samples and listen to it through a set of headphones. And um, listening through headphones is like listening through good eyeglasses, through speakers in this room. It's like you've got fuzzy eyeglasses that are defocusing the image a little bit. So you don't really see exactly what's going on. Okay, so we're ready to play. So first the original. The Navy attacked the big task force. 1400. The Navy attacked the big task force. 2400. The Navy attacked the big task force. And the El on older coder. The Navy attacked the big task force. Okay, I'll do them again. The original. The Navy attacked the big task force. 1400. The Navy attacked the big task force. 2400. The Navy attacked the big task force. And the reference vocoder. The Navy attacked the big task force. Now I'd like to play the samples with background noise. This is the original. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. 2400. Easy to tell the depth of a well. And a reference codec. Easy to tell the depth of a well. So, so that was truck noise that was being played in the background and um, they particularly chose that because it has that periodicity and it can upset the algorithms that estimate the pitch in the algorithm. So, particularly chosen to be nasty. Okay, how do you develop codecs? These things have really complex uh, DSP algorithms inside them. Um, you can't just single step with a debugger, look at lines of code or lines of numbers, it just doesn't make sense. You need a way to uh, interpret uh, the algorithm, see what's going on. I like to do that graphically. I like to plot the waveforms on the screen, sort of like a, a software oscilloscope. Um, so uh, what I do is I run the codec uh, using, uh, in non-real time, I use stored samples, play one sample, Navy attack the big task force, 
put it through the algorithm, look at the output file. While it's running, I dump a bunch of text files that plot all the internal states of the various DSP algorithms. Then I use some scripts I've written in GNU Octave uh, to visualise the eternal wave forms. And I've just got a, a little bit of code in those scripts that allows me to single step through frames uh, in GNU Octave and get a feel for uh, what's going on. To really evaluate the codex, you need to do listening tests. As I said, we plug in headphones, have a listen to it. We listen to that same utterance over and over and over again, and it drives you nuts. Um, because it's all subjective, you might listen to various different processing algorithms. They'll sound like one order the day, on one day, you'll wake up in the morning, listen to them again, they'll sound like a different order of preference. So it really can be hard to develop these things and very tiring uh, on the ears. So here's an example of the uh, GNU Octave sort of plots I get. Um, up here is the original waveform. Uh, this is the same waveform plotted against frequency. Uh, this particular algorithm I'm visualising here is the pitch estimator. It looks at the input speech and tries to work out what the pitch of that frame is. Is it you know, 80 hertz or 230 hertz? Um, so these are various processing steps in the algorithm. Uh, down here, down here, and then eventually I get this sort of plot here where I try to... <coughs> the peak here indicates the uh, pitch of the actual frequency, in this case around 100 hertz, which is about right. And I've got a little window here that I just can single step back and forth. Sometimes, uh, and quite often, these algorithms fail, so I have to zoom into what frame it failed, try and work out why, and try and improve it. Codec 2 and weapons of mass destructions. Okay, um, there's an Australian um, body, uh, government body called uh, DECO that maintains a document called the Banned Exports List. It was pointed out to me that I better check out this document a few months ago. Scanning it, I see things like uranium, certain chemicals, nuclear weapons design software, and speech codecs beneath 2400 bits per second. <laughs> Oops. And uh, I think the issue is these uh, devices have uh, tactical battlefield applications. If you have very low bitrate speech, you don't need much power to get your message through, and on a battlefield that can mean life or death. Um, so they do have some defence applications. Um, this is an open source project. I'm just sort of throwing it up there on the internet. I'm not really exporting it, but you know, I thought I'd better get this checked out. So um, I emailed the guys at Deco, and uh, they said to fill in a form. And the form up, up the top had, um, is your thing you're exporting on the Deco band's export list or on the lists of weapons of mass destruction? <laughs> so I never thought I'd be filling out a form with my codec with that on it, but sure enough. Uh, I had to. I um, sent the form in a few months later. A few weeks later, chased them up, and they've advised me that Codec Two has been assessed as not controlled. Um, that's good news. I don't think it was a really good fit to their model, though. They wanted things like who's the address of who I'm exporting it to, and you know how do I handle that with a an open source project? Well, I write down IPs, or you know, what are you? How much are you selling it for? Well, I'm giving it away. It's just one of those things that fell through the cracks. But I felt I better do the right thing. So I'm still waiting for the certificate. Uh, the official certificate, and that's going to be a really good blog post when I get that one. <laughs> okay, and that's it. So, open for questions now. Um, so, if you have any questions, and you can speak across the microphone like this, and I'd like to try to have it for lunch. It's, it's had a hard time. Uh, oh, I have to go at the back and have where I start. No. <laughs> <laughs> What level of, um, do you do any, yeah, so the mute is off. Now it's on. <laughs> Trying to not lean down. Um, what level of, uh, when you're looking at a new frame for the codec, how much of, does it look at the old frames or is it, completely assessing new fra frame is new every time? Most of it is, yeah, just frame by frame. There's a little bit of, um, takes a little bit of data about, say, what the previous pitch was when it's calculating the, the pitch for the new frame. Yeah, but not much uh, memory involved at all. Okay, a lot of questions. Let's keep them quick. I think there are more hands up here to start with. Do you know the person that uh, suggested looking on the uh, export certification, how they happened to come across it? Yeah, uh, the same thing applies for the US, so he was aware of that, and we tend to copy a lot of the US's regulations. Okay. So he found it on the US list and said, you better check out your Australian one. Yeah. Hey, thanks for the talk. Thank um, you. I was just wondering, when you're building a model of the speech language, does it affect uh, different type of languages that people are speaking, like, say, Nordic languages or African languages or something like that, or is this based around an English model? 
Uh, no, it's sort of based around human speech articulation. Um, we'd like to do a few more tests with things like Mandarin and tonal Asian languages. The only, traditionally the only languages that fail on speech codex are, you know, the Hottentots and gods must be crazy type, click, click, stop, stop. They're not really designed for that. They don't do a lot of speech coding. Hmm. <laughs> there are a few hands up the back here. Who, who else up here had a question? No, I'll pass it over there. I think part of the reason for uh, putting these kind of codecs under, under expert regulation could be that they are used in systems like Echelon and different surveillance systems for identifying individuals. You can actually tell us a little bit uh, how big, like what the data that I heard is like about seven kilobyte of data is enough to identify the speaker. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit I don't how easy it is to identify this, who actually it is talking out of say thousand million people Billion people of yeah, I'm sorry, I don't really know how those speaker recognition technologies work. I've uh, got okay. some rough idea theoretically, but yeah. Okay. I don't intend to get into them. <laughs> um, I noticed that even the original samples there uh, sounded quite kind of muted compared to natural speech. Is that just a function of a limited sample rate? Uh, they're band limited, so they're like telephone quality speech. So the same sort of thing you'd hear over telephone. Um, could you give us some idea of your estimates of what the um, encoding and decoding uh, uh, computational power is required to do both and uh, memory requirements on each end? Sure. It's the sort of thing that will fit on a big microcontroller eventually, so 10, 20 MIPS, tens of kilobytes of storage. This man's hand's been up for ages. Yep. Um, just a quick one. With the uh, initial... Uh, frequency band, are you encoding that as, as like literally 50, 55, 60, 65 linearly? Because I've just been doing some calculations and if you encode it logarithmically, you can do it in five bits. Yeah. Um, yeah. Getting um, slightly more resolution at the lower frequencies. Yeah, currently it's encoded just linearly in frequency, but yeah, it probably could save a bit or two. Uh, that's the sort of thing you have to implement, listen to a few times and make sure it works across a range of speakers, but yeah, possibly. Well, not that two bits may, so it'd save a heck of a lot there. Yeah, it's, it's useful at these bit rates. Mm. I know someone over here who's been waiting a while. No, I'll go over here then. Uh, how far are you away from putting in modems and letting hams use it over the air? A few hams have already used it over the air. Uh, they put their own modems up to it uh, about a year ago, yeah, when the first code came out. Just, just further touching on the, the, the ham bit there and the hardware question that we had earlier. Um, in its current implementation, um, is it easily you know, usable on any device other than like a, a full-fledged full, full -fledged computer? Or is there currently an implementation of it that can be loaded into a microcontroller, as Tess touched on earlier, and implemented in a ham situation as it currently stands so that you, know, you, you could use it in a QRP situation in the middle of nowhere? Um, as opposed to needing to lug a laptop or another computer around which requires more power and, and, and whatnot. Yeah, the limiting factor there is it's all floating point code at the moment. It needs to be fixed to really run efficiently on a small device. Having said that, some of the <coughs> fixed point, you know, panda boards, little boards you can buy these days, it's running even though they're only fixed point. It runs in software, uh, software flow emulation on some of those. Not real well, but it runs, yeah. So the next step is a fixed point. Once we get the algorithm sorted, we'll do a fixed point implementation and then get it onto some small chips. How far away are you estimating that uh, Hard to say, yeah. Um, you mentioned a few other applications, like, like say, for instance, short um, messages, like, say, uh, voicemail. Do you know of any other of people trying to use it for other applications like that, like doing it, say, for voicemail services or anything like that? Because it clearly cut down a lot on the size of just downloading waves yeah. or something. Yeah, one interesting application for that is if um, something like the Freedom Box, if you're, say, uh, in a country where the government's cut down the internet and all you've got is a very low bitrate satcom link out of the, uh, the country, well now you can send uh, 30 or 40 phone calls, people can communicate, uh, where before you couldn't send any or only one phone call. So that's one application I'm particularly interested in. Mm. So David finished a bit early, so there's plenty of time for more questions. Um, there's one up here. 
you have any samples with um, introduced bit errors that we could le listen to? No, but I'm waiting for someone to do that. So if anyone wants to put some bit errors into it and play it to me, I'd love to hear that. Do you know how it would perform? Is that going to uh, I have some gut, well? gut ideas or some gut feel. Um, typically a speech codec, it, once we get it tuned, it should be okay for up to 5% random errors, maybe 10, if we put some clever algorithms into it. Yeah. Can I just say thanks for building this as a patent-free codec? That's really fantastic. Another one up the back. I'll come back to you in a sec, sir. Hi, David. Um, saw the saw your um, talk at last year's LCA about the Delhi Village Telco. Any thought about maybe using this as a trunking sort of solution for some of their, some of their sort of communication Yeah, needs? Yeah, that's one possibility. Um, the other possibility I thought of was actually hacking the Wi-Fi protocols and sending low bitrate data over 2.4 gigahertz. Currently the lowest rate we've got is one megabit on Wi-Fi and this gives you a 30 dB advantage in signal to noise ratio. So 1400 is, is extremely impressive. And, um, do you have a feel for what the theoretical limits might be for human beings? I think beings? we can get similar sort of quality around 800. Yeah. <laughs> is there anybody who hasn't yet asked a question at this con who has a question? <laughs> behind, All behind the way down there. here. Yeah. So if you get it that way, you can make it turn into the matrix with the... Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just worry that... Um, there's the possibility that some evil, well-financed uh, organisation may somehow try to uh, um, claim patent rights uh, in, in, from your work. Uh, do you think that's possible? And uh, you know what? <laughs> what can be done to prevent that? Sure. Kind there's of two behavior? issues there. One is they may claim it without having a valid legal claim, but just cause me a lot of grief. Bruce Perens has suggested that he has a bunch of lawyers in the States that can cause them more grief than they can possibly <laughs> cause us. So I'm not too worried about that. Um, the other issue is, um, yeah, they may do, and I'll just go and uh, work out another way to do it. And uh, if they do find something that I'm using that infringes a patent. Um, I've, there's another presentation I've got where I list the prior art. It's all 1960s, 1970s, 1980s technology uh, that I'm basing it on. Um, and one thing I would like, a nice little cool mini project, is do a proper patent survey. You know, just go, go through everything from end to end that I'm using and the patents out there and make sure there's nothing infringing before we lock down the bitstream and people start using it. Are there any more questions? Answers? Comments? More thank yous? <laughs> oh. Uh, if, if I'm understanding the decode end correctly, it's pretty much the summation of uh, sine waves of the same harmonic Yes. Uh, in different amplitudes. It, would it be at all possible to implement the decode end uh, with a, a large analogue section, I guess it's generating the sine waves, and then a, a smaller... Um, the, the decode just really mixing together those sine, those already generated sine waves at the appropriate pitch. Um, There's all sorts of possible ways to do it. I actually do it in the frequency domain, so I set up a bunch of sine waves just as lines, mm. and then it, it invert an FFT. There's also possibilities of mixed analog and digital techniques. You can send yeah. some of the information as analog <laughs> over the channel, and some as digital that people have played with. Yeah. Hey, and it's open source, so feel free to experiment. Uh, oh, all the way up there. I was worried about how I, how I was going to get my exercise today. Thank you. You mentioned something about dealing with um, periodic noise like sirens. How does the codec handle a siren? I haven't tested this one on a siren. I've heard some others that break down pretty badly. Um, right. Where you get into real problems where it starts to mimic some of the aspects of human speech and then it gets really confused. Two speakers is another good test at the same time as well. Mm. Uh, you mentioned uh, fault error correction before. What sort of erasure codes are you talking about there and um, how does that contrast to your worrying about overhead when sending single packets over like a U single UDP packet? Yeah, opinion is sharply divided over FEC and which codes we should use. I'm, I'm um, suggesting a very lightweight approach. 
and using the inherent robustness of the codec. So various codes have been um, proposed. You really need fairly short block lengths, which limits it. Things like turbo codes and uh, LDPC are just too long a block, so they're not particularly useful. Yeah. So no one's really said that yet, and I'm really leaving that up to other people at the moment. I've got enough work to do with the codec. You uh, said you've got um, some voicing bits. Uh, how do you detect whether you've spoken a consonant or a vowel? I use something, um, I, I basically look at the signal and compare it to what it would look like if it was all voiced. And if it was all voiced, it would be that harmonic spectrum I showed you. If it was uh, unvoiced or a um, consonant, then it would be more noise-like and it wouldn't have a good match to those uh, harmonics. So you, you, you compare both possibilities and choose the one that's the most likely and make a decision based on that. Okay, we've got time for just one or two more questions. I will run it up here. Hello. Um, do you remove uh, noise, say, from the, by working in the frequency domain? No, I don't have any noise um, removal at the moment, but it's a really good idea because rather than trying to deal with it, to remove it entirely and improve the quality of the signal yep. is probably the way to go. Yep. I did some of that a long time ago. <laughs> oh, good. Any more collaborative efforts like that? <laughs> okay, well, um, it is David, right? It is David, yep. Good. I'm, I'm not embarrassing myself on a live stream. <laughs> that, that particular bit of um, communication has come through to me, okay? <laughs> uh, he's already received his penguin, but you know, give it up for him one more time. Hey, thank you. Thanks a lot.